Now, I want you to know, this isn't just another war story. This is something different. It's a blueprint for survival. A design so incredibly tough that its core principles are, and I mean this, almost certainly keeping you safe right now, and you probably don't even realize it. So we're going to break down how a floating inferno, a ship that by all rights should have been on the ocean floor in minutes, somehow survived and became one of the greatest teachers in the history of engineering and human courage. Okay, let's dive right in. The date is March 19, 1945. Picture this. You're in the Pacific Ocean, just 50 miles off the coast of Japan. You're on the aircraft carrier USS Franklin, and the whole steel deck is just humming with the tension of combat. The first wave of planes is already in the air, and the second wave, well, they're being armed and fueled right there on deck. Now you have to understand, this is the most vulnerable a carrier can possibly be. It's basically a floating powder keg, with tons of gasoline and high explosives just sitting out in the open. And at 7.08 in the morning, the enemy found them. Two. That's all it took. Just two bombs. A single Japanese dive bomber seems to just materialize out of the clouds, completely undetected. In the span of maybe 30 seconds, he releases two 550-pound bombs with absolutely horrifying accuracy. The first one punches right through the flight deck and detonates in the hangar below, right in the middle of all those fueled and armed aircraft. The second bomb slams into the back of the flight deck, where 31 planes are warming up for launch. It was a perfect, devastating strike. The effect was instantaneous, just chaos. The hangar deck becomes a literal furnace. Temperatures skyrocket to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that's hot enough to make solid steel glow a dull red. Fuel from all the ruptured tanks starts flowing across the deck like a river of fire, and in a terrible, terrible irony, the ship's own ventilation system starts pumping all those flammable vapors throughout the entire vessel, feeding the flames even more. On the flight deck, planes start exploding in a chain reaction, creating this rolling wave of fire that sailors on other ships could feel from a thousand yards away. The human cost in just those first few moments is its staggering. 807 men are killed or wounded. To this day, it remains the single worst disaster ever endured by a U.S. warship that actually survived war. Think about that. More than a third of the crew, just gone in an instant. The ship is burning from the inside out, it's listing heavily, it's dead in the water, a complete sitting duck. The ship's navigator, a lieutenant commander named Steven Yurika, he described what he saw from the bridge. He said, The after two-thirds of the flight deck was a sea of flame. Men were on fire, running, rolling, jumping over the side. You had aircraft exploding, some even launching themselves off the deck as their engines caught fire. And even worse, these experimental tiny Tim rockets, each with 500 pounds of high explosive, started to cook off, screaming across the deck like meteors, tearing through steel and men. It was, by every single account, a vision of absolute hell. And that really is the central question, isn't it? By every law of naval warfare, the Franklin should have been on the bottom of the Pacific. A series of massive explosions should have broken her back. The fire should have caused a total structural collapse. But the Franklin just refused to sink. So to understand why, we have to leave the battle for a moment. We've got to go back in time to the mind of the man who actually designed the ship. You see, the hero of this part of the story isn't a sailor. He's a shipbuilder, a man named Homer Lenoir Ferguson. He was the president of Newport News Shipbuilding back in the late 1930s, and he championed this really radical design philosophy for the new Essex class of carriers. For decades, naval architects had always treated armor as just dead weight. You'd build a ship, and then you'd bolt heavy, protective plates onto it. But Ferguson, he argued the complete opposite. He asked, what if, instead of adding armor, you built the entire ship out of it? What if every single structural plate, every beam, every bulkhead provided both the ship's strength and its protection? This is the crucial point. It makes the ship a single, integrated, resilient whole, not just a structure with a protective shell wrapped around it. Now, the key to making this vision a reality was this miracle material, special treatment steel, or STS. Think of it like a hybrid. It could resist shrapnel from shells, just like armor plate, but it was also flexible enough to be bent, welded, and formed into all the complex shapes a ship needs. The problem? Well, it was way more expensive than standard steel. The Navy initially balked at the cost, but Ferguson argued that while the price tag was high up front, the payoff would be saving lives. And maybe, just maybe, the ship itself. So, Ferguson's blueprint really came down to these three core principles. First, use that expensive SDS steel for the ship's very bones. Second, radical compartmentalization. The ship wasn't made of these big open spaces. No, it was like a honeycomb with hundreds of small isolated compartments designed to contain fire and flooding. And third, redundancy. 
the Franklin had multiple independent fire mains, all powered by nine separate fire pumps. It was a design philosophy that just assumed the absolute worst was going to happen, and it built the solution in from the very beginning. Okay, so now let's go back to the Franklin's burning deck. Because that brilliant engineering blueprint, it didn't just save a ship, it created a platform where human courage actually had a fighting chance against completely impossible odds. About 90 minutes into the disaster, the absolute worst-case scenario happens. A magazine deep inside the ship, packed with large 5-inch ammunition, explodes. Sailors on nearby destroyers were certain they had just watched the Franklin break in two. A massive fireball erupted 500 feet into the air. This is the kind of blast that ends ships, period. But it didn't end the Franklin. And this, right here, is the payoff of Ferguson's design. The bulkheads surrounding that magazine, all made of that special steel, they didn't shatter. They bent, they warped, but they held. They contained the horizontal force of the blast and channeled all that energy upward, out through the already mangled decks. The ship's spine held. That expensive steel had just paid for itself a thousand times over. It was this structural integrity that allowed heroes to emerge. You had Father Joseph O'Callaghan, a Jesuit priest who also happened to be a physics professor, organizing firefighting parties in that searing heat because he realized the ship wasn't melting, it was actually holding together. Deep below, Lieutenant Donald Gary sealed his engine room from the smoke. He jury-rigged the system to pump in breathable air and miraculously restored power. And this allowed Captain Leslie Jarrus to make the stunning decision to get the ship moving under its own power, an act of pure defiance that gave the entire crew hope. Their courage was unbelievable, but it was the ship beneath their feet that made it all possible. And so began one of the most remarkable voyages in all of naval history. A ship that was literally declared sunk was now moving at two knots, then eight, then 15. She traveled thousands of miles across the Pacific, this floating wreck, arriving first at Ulithi Atoll, then Pearl Harbor, and finally, under her own power, she steamed right into the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It was the ultimate proof of her incredible design. But the Franklin's journey didn't end there. In fact, you could argue her most important mission was just beginning. She was about to transform from a casualty of war into the U.S. Navy's most valuable teacher. See, the Franklin's survival wasn't some fluke. It was a statistical certainty that was born from a superior design philosophy. Of the 14 Essex-class carriers that saw combat in World War II, not a single one was sunk. They were hit by bombs, torpedoes, and kamikazes 39 times, but every single one of them came home. Now compare that to the Japanese fleet, which lost four of its best carriers in a single day at Midway, mostly because they just lacked that kind of structural protection. This wasn't about luck, this was about engineering. Instead of just scrapping the ship, the Navy spent months crawling through the Franklin's wreckage. They measured exactly how the steel warped, they mapped how the blasts were contained, and they documented how every one of those redundant systems worked or didn't. The result was War Damage Report Number 56, a document that basically became the Bible for future warship design. The lessons learned from the Franklin were built into every single American aircraft carrier that came after her. So, what's the ultimate takeaway from all this? Well, it's an idea that's much bigger than just one ship. It's about the concept of the invisible victory, the triumph that happens in the design phase, years before a crisis ever even hits. Donald Gary, the engineer who restored power, wrote something profound years later. He said, remember that systems don't fail, people fail. His point was this, you have to design systems that are so resilient that they support people when they are at their absolute limit when they are exhausted, terrified, and ready to quit. The ship will carry them. You have to build that kind of ship. And that philosophy right there is the Franklin's true legacy, designed for the worst possible day. Build in backups for your backups. Create systems that bend but don't break, that degrade gracefully instead of failing catastrophically. These principles, proven in the fires of the Pacific, are now the bedrock of modern safety engineering. It's why the airliner you fly in has multiple engines, why spacecraft have backup systems, and why modern buildings are designed to sway, not just collapse. You know, Hummer Ferguson's victory wasn't won on March 19, 1945. It was won years earlier, in a drawing office, when he insisted on a more expensive, more resilient design. He never received a medal for it, but his work saved over 1,700 lives on that one day. Which really leaves us with a final thought. What are the unseen blueprints, the redundant systems, the invisible victories of engineering that are quietly protecting you right now in your everyday life?